Did it say that it's being recorded? Uh, yeah, I see it. Mm -hmm. It's being recorded. Okay, nice. Okay, so hi, I'm Pavitra, and we are going to be attacking um, chapter six today, which I should have actually indicated on this, but whatever. So this basically gets into multiple um, uh, into uh, multiple regression. So we did linear regression last time, and we get into multiple regression now. So here we have more than one explanatory variable. So basically, we have one outcome, and we can have more than one uh, explanatory. And they start off with using one numerical and one categorical. And the, the, the data set that's being used is, um, I think we did this last time, but I can't quite remember, is the, the, the teaching score of, for a teacher. And they are considering age and gender. And as you can tell, age is a numerical variable and the gender is a, a categorical variable or a factor. So the idea is that is, is can we actually see older instructors getting better evaluation? or the younger ones do, and is there any difference based on the gender, etc. And so towards this, we have one outcome, one numerical, and one categorical variable to make this determination. So, um, so the data set here is, uh, is as you can see here, it's, it's evals underscore CH6. We are selecting, it's, it's a fairly large data set, so I'm not quite sure why things are being like sort of like lopped on, on at the edges. I, I, I really don't know if it's something to do with the build, <clears throat> but whatever. Um, I'm sorry, it, it doesn't look very good, but I'm sorry about that. So we are selecting a few columns and we do a glimpse. And as you can see, we have the ID, the score, age, and gender. So we are basically interested in the score, age, and, and gender. And we're going to just do some simple summary statistics. And uh, Matt actually got into this last time. The three, we have the three principle or whatever, like to actually determine, do a quick EDA. We, look, we do a glimpse and then we do a, a skim, which I think is really awesome. The skim basically gives you uh, a lot of the information that you would need to have used like multiple statements before. And once you, uh, and so basically from this, you can tell that you have one factor, you have one integer, and you have the numeric. So the score, is all the way at the bottom and then you have the age and then you have um, gender so we um, since we have selected those three we are seeing those types there uh, we are also going to do a, a correlation between the score and age and it really doesn't look so great like it's um, it's minus uh, 0 0.107 so um, it's even even though it's a negative code it's it's a negative slope it's still the correlation is still fairly uh, poor so what we are going to do now is that we are actually going to take a look at age and teaching score on the x and y axes respectively and we're going to color by the gender just to see uh, what what it just looks like so the, this is the third step of our eda where we actually run it through lm i mean we actually run it through ggplot to get a fair idea of what the distribution of the data is and we um we can actually see how the how the data is spread and distributed etc so looking at this, you, you can see that, um, um, I don't know, like if anyone wants to jump in, you're more than welcome to, but it's, I mean, it's, it's just all over the place, right? Like it, it, you really can't like, make a whole lot of sense. And by the way, if anyone has any comments or any uh, observations, please do feel free to like just jump in. Um, so, and so this basically is the third step, um, the second step of our EDA. And now what we will do is that we will actually run LM to see what, um, what kind of uh, model would fit this best. So I think what the, the graph did tell us, however, was even though it's, it's, it's like super scattered, you can see that about the age of 60, women pretty much are not represented on this, um, on this at all. So in other words, we don't have any faculty over the age of 60. We do have a negative slope on this, and secondly, the slope for women appears to be more negative than it is for men. So in other words, they are they, they're probably having to work harder for that score and they are not, you know, they're being penalized a lot more as they get older relative to um, relative to, to the men. And so having said that, um, I am not sure if you've caught it caught what Matt said the last time because I did not and I had to spend a fair amount of time today actually going over that. When you include a categorical variable in your data, so in this case our gender is the categorical variable, you 
also establish what is called a baseline. So your baseline would be the group that appears the first alphabetically, which uh, was a little bit surprising to me. But anyway, it's, it's the first group that shows up alphabetically and that forms your baseline, baseline for comparison. And every other group is going to be offset relative to that. And this is extremely specific to categorical. And I only realized this today because I have done a lot of LMs before, but I actually realized I've never done it with categorical variables. So this kind of threw me in for a loop and I didn't know what I was looking at. And so when you actually fit your variables and you uh, run your models, what you will see here, and this is a fairly busy slide, I do apologize for this. So the first line, let's just walk through this slowly and feel free to stop me. Uh, that we are fitting the regression model, and when we want to look at interaction terms, so please uh, pay close attention to the fact that you have the score tilde, and you have the age uh, asterisk gender, and not age plus gender, as we're used to seeing with um, normal uh, continuous variables. So this is uh, something very specific to categorical and more specific to interactions in, in particular. So uh, that's the first thing to note. And once, <clears throat> once you have run your LM and you have your, mar your, your um, regression model, you actually can use this cool thing, which I think is only specific to modern dive. I think get regression table is, is a function in the modern dive package and you would need to install it to use it. It's not available in any in, in of the others. And it, uh, what it is giving you here is um, the, really the columns of interest are the first and the second one. You have the intercept and you have the estimate. So. The intercept, as you know, is basically the, pres the lack of any explanatory variable. So in other words, it's, it's just the, the, the noise inherent in your, um, it's, it's, it's just the noise inherent in your model. So what you're seeing as 4.88 is basically, um, if you recall what you have on your y-axis, it was the score. So you would get a score, so I apologize for that, you would get a score of 4.88 regardless of what the age, if the age was zero, if the gender was non-existent, which you know could not happen. So in this case, it's, it's basically, it's, it's just a sort of a, um, it's, it's, it's not really very logic, not logically sound, but suffice to say the intercept is, is the value of your outcome variable if in the absence of any explanatory variables, which in this case cannot really happen. So that is, and because of the fact that this, we are doing what is called a base, establishing a baseline, that intercept that you see is actually for women. So gender, female, male. So female shows up first, correct? So that is your, uh, your categorical variable. So since F is actually, like it's alphabetically uh, higher than M, what you're seeing here is the intercept for the female candidates. And what you're seeing on line two or age is actually the slope for female um, teachers or female candidates. Again, I'm just gonna say candidates. So since it's minus 0 0.018, basically it tells you that with every one unit of increase in the score, it, I'm sorry, with, with every one unit increase in age, you will have a, 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 a minus 0 0.018 unit decrease in your score. So that's, that's basically the relationship of uh, what you're seeing there. So now number three, which is gender male, is now where the offsets begin. So this is your offset for the male factor, uh, male categorical variable, and, um, and, and this, so this relates to the intercept. So the intercept for the male would be 4.88 minus 0 0.446, since you have a negative sign there. So it would be offset from that. If it didn't have, didn't have a minus, you would just add it and that would be your actual value. So what you're seeing here are the offsets and not the absolute values. So, and for gen, age, gender male, and number four is, is the so-called interaction term. And really, I need to stop here, guys, because I really need everyone to put their thinking hats on. So I'm not quite sure what Albert meant when he said that R does age, but it's like actually age male and then I am really confused. So does it mean that when we have an interaction term on number four, where you, are, you have the interaction of age and gender, but it's for the gender male, like is there an age and gender interaction for female or is that just gonna be called age, but there's actually an implicit 
um, interaction there. I, for the life of me, I, I looked up a bunch of different sites and I, I'm not able to figure that out. So anyone who knows better, please feel free to jump in. Yeah, so it is tricky, Pavitra. It is, it is really tricky. What's happening is the intercept, that's actually the average um, score for females, age zero. That's in your intercept. And then with your age, now for every marginal increase in age, they get a negative drop in score. So that's telling you what your females would score based on um, this model. And then what happens is your intercept changes for males. So your average uh, score for males drops by that 0.446 mm -hmm. off, off the bat, but then they get a marginal increase in score for every year in age. But the marginal, well, it's not even a marginal increase because you're, what you're doing is you're offsetting the age um, coefficient by that gender male coefficient. So you're taking the negative 0 0.018 plus 0 0.14, and that's now your marginal um, change in score for every year of age. So Did that track. That means, sorry. Uh, so number. So line number two for age. So that already has an interaction factor with female gender implicit in that. Correct or exactly? Or yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. So that's female only, and intercepts female only. And then when you get down to the three and four, now you're offsetting the intercept and you're offsetting age for now your males. So if you're predicting for a male, you'll use three and four. If you're predicting for a female, you'll use uh, one and two. So then we actually cannot see the interaction uh, or rather we can't um, separate the interaction between age and gender in this if we run the model this way, correct? Like since we have specifically said, okay, so let me ask you this question. Instead of doing age um, um, star gender, if I did age plus gender, would that mean that I was not looking at interaction or is it, or is it that because gender is categorical that it's necessarily gonna need that? Uh, I'm having a hard time differentiating between um, categorical versus why this interaction needs to come into play like okay yeah that's a good good question so what you would do when you're just do the plus when you're not doing the interaction your intercept so your your age offset so your marginal um change in score per year of age is the same yeah. whether you're male or female but your Correct. starting point is different based on male or female so that's why the 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 lines in his parallel slope graph, like his lines, um, yeah. the, the space between those lines is always the same. They just have different starting points. So what you, what, when you do the um, non-interaction model, okay. you're, not get, you're getting the same slope, right? And so what's, what's defining, what's allowing us to have a different slope is that additional line for there. Because because that the, the the change the marginal change in score for every year of age is different whether you're a female or a, or a male when you look at it from the uh, interaction model. So this is an interaction graph, yeah. This one's the interaction exactly. So the so then that means by default everything that we are plugging into G into ggplot is by default an interaction plot, right? Like so. Yeah, you're always looking. Yeah. But Whatever you group by in your ggplot, you're going to show the uh, different slopes for those. But I always recall having done age plus something. I don't ever remember having done age into gender. Admittedly, I haven't done categorical. So, I, uh, you know. Well, most, yeah, most models you'll run will be the, just the normal plus. Like, right. I mean, it gets so confusing with these interaction terms. Like, th this is about as simple an interaction model as you'll ever get because one of yeah. your um, predictive variables is uh, categorical but um, if you use more predictors or if you're using um, multiple continuous variables and, and you're doing interactions with those it gets very um, complex I mean, this is still complex <laughs> to wrap your head around so um, yeah and then ggpot just plots it plots interaction models by default 
I mean, but it's only so whether it's categorical or continuous, it's always doing an interaction plot, yeah. Yeah. So, so which means that when you have a plot where you have multiple, when you and you provide multiple explanatory variables, you know that there it that it's taking into account those interactions. So you cannot actually tell it that I want I want a graph. Um, well, I guess I could do that. Uh, well, I mean, but I see, I remember like when I have multiple variables, like I'm using like score plus something like I don't, I, is that because it's, it's not categorical? Like I don't ever, ever remember having done a star, like just me, you know? So I don't know, maybe this is not something which can be resolved now, but <laughs> anyway. Well, so suffice to say, the this huge ginormous equation all the way at the bottom is what is tied to your interaction um, e um, uh, event here. So you have the, the B naught or the, the beta naught if you want to use the, you know, the, the Greek um, parameter, parametric notation. Um, and of course, you have the B, B uh, age dot age that is again for the female. So this is your intercept. This is your age and um, parameter for for the female. And then the one is male is what is called an indicator function. So if the person is a male, then it's a one. Else, it's a zero. So if it's a zero, then this whole uh, expression becomes a zero. And this here is actually your um, interaction uh, event uh, or interaction. Um, whatever they call that, uh, it's the interaction. And you're looking at um, age, uh, age male, and then you have the age, the age itself, which is the, um, your, uh, the explanatory variable. And then this is your indicator function, which tells you if, if it's a male or, 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 a, or not. So now we get into this other one, which is, um, so, so how did I actually get this to plot as a score? Oh, wait. How did I get this to plot as a slope where the uh, slope, a parallel slope where the other one was an interaction? Did what was it about the? Graph? the it's the geom. It's the geom. It's geom smooth versus geom. Um, oh, parallel. geom parallel slopes. Oh, I see. And I actually think that the the parallel slopes geom is from the modern dive package because I think they said that, like That's like we were saying, by default it's going to do the interaction term. Another thing worth noting, going back a little bit. Um, is they actually do, they do use interaction terms for um, uh, two numerical explanatory variables. So it's not, it's not, oh, is it's, that not right? just, it's not just because it's categorical. Um, they, it's, it's in like, I think it's in the related topics section of this I chapter, see. which I guess is technically after the main body. I but, see. Um, but yeah, okay, just so that's good that. to know. Yeah. Because I, I, yeah, I, I don't think I had felt like that question had been answered. Okay, that's good to know. So it's not not an aspect of category. So I guess that begs the question: when you would use um, one over the other? You know, I mean, maybe if you wanted to look at collinearity, or if you wanted to see look for colliders. I don't know. Um, well, anyway. Yeah. yeah, we can we can talk about that question if you want, or we can wait. Um, I think it actually, I kind of touch upon that as we, um, as, as I go through this, like, I oh, okay, good. yeah. Um, so, okay. So here you can tell that again, the slope is negatively, um, they're negative. And of course the female is more negative than the male. And you do have, um, you have different intercepts, even though the slopes are the same. So that's the, um, I guess, um, so, and that's, um, sorry. And so that's what it, well, that's the difference between the interaction and the parallel slopes is that the slopes are the same for parallel slopes, but the intercepts are different. And um, if, you, if, you, if, if you do the same thing that you did, but here you would use a plus uh, as opposed to like, a, uh, like an into, what you would get here is three lines as opposed to four, where you would have the intercept and um, the intercept would again represent the, 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 the female uh, because the intercepts are different, correct? So like we know that the intercepts are different based on this, the intercepts are, like you can tell that they're starting from different locations. So the intercepts are different. 
and uh, but the age since the slopes are the same you only have one unit for age and because the slopes are same for both male or female so this would not change the minus 0 0.009 so for every one unit change in your um, in what is it the score uh, or rather for every one unit change in your age your score would actually um, go down by this much for both for males or females the thing is that no matter whether you use this method or that you end up with the same equation and the reason is because look at how different this is relative to how it was on the um, on the other one um, the gender male is 0 0.014 and you can tell that here it's 0 0.191 so clearly it's like the weight here is, is considerably higher so even though the slopes are going to be the same this particular aspect the intercept for male only is higher so actually what ends up happening is that even though the the equation looks different now relative to the other one where you had the interaction term you actually get exactly the same answer when you plug like plug, plug, plug your um uh, the your your numbers back into the equation so you actually end up with the same thing which is which is pretty wild if you think about it so um and it's that's a bit hard to tell unless i'd had a slide comparing the two sets of equations side by side which i didn't have time to do but um suffice to say that it gives you the same answer at the end of it okay so i don't know why this ended up so scrunched i just wanted you to take a look at these two again like this is your interaction this is your parallel and you can tell that you know the the data distribution etc everything else is the same except that here you actually have this interaction thing going on and here your slopes are are both the same so um hey does anyone know how that slope is computed if you don't have um if if you're not using uh, if if they are the same what does that mean like does it mean that you're not using any explanatory variable but then in that case you wouldn't have a slope so how was that slope even computed it's the uh, average change in in score for every year of age regardless of um gender i see so you would just use age as an explanatory without um without using the, a, um, the the gender aspect and just derive that well, that? you know, you'd still model on age and, and gender. It's just that for your um, your uh, the, the slope itself, it's going to look at, well, yeah. So your intercept's obviously different. The slope's going to be the same because it's computing, it's taking your marginal change in score for every year of age, regardless of gender, but you're starting at different. So your intercepts, so it does help to put in the, um, um, put in every you know predictor that's relevant but in this case you will get different uh starting points because the average score at zero age is different but the marginal increase or decrease in score is the same because it's not taking that into account unless you do the interaction and then you'll got get increase or decrease based on if they're male or female okay got it okay Okay, so then he then they get into two numerical explanatory variables, and this is um, I think what Matt said, where they actually use um, two numerical, and you're right, they do use interaction here as well. So uh, here it's just the same drill again. You get do a little bit of glimpse. You look at your summary statistics, and they are basically interested here. I think in looking at debt vis-a-vis -vis the uh, the age and income and if there's yeah so they're looking at the credit limit and income and and, trying to, and your your outcome variable here is the debt so when you actually do the correlation you can see that your correlation between your credit limit and debt is fairly high and um of course the diagonal is all one because it's the same unit and then um also your um the income and debt is 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 not so great so it's it's uh, and also you can actually the interesting thing is you can actually even look at the correlation between your explanatory variables so you can look at credit limit and you can look at income and you can see that they're about 0 0.8 which indicates which sort of gives you the idea that they could be collinear so like in other words there's not much new information to be had but i think they don't really delve into that at this point but suffice to say that because that you that that number is fairly high you could be looking at 
um, two explanatory variables that are kind of like, you know, like going along with each other. So there's not like any really value add in having both of them. So um, they do not talk about collinearity here though in any great detail. So we won't really touch upon that. Uh, so here, if you look at um, the two, so they're basically looking at the outcome versus the explanatory and they're doing it separately just to see what what they look like just by themselves. And you can see that debt and credit limit are like really, it's a tight relationship. It's probably a pretty high correlation coefficient. And the other guy is just like sort of, and uh, I, admittedly, I think it's probably also because we don't have a log scale on the income, which uh, I don't know if, yeah, I don't know if that would have changed things up, maybe not, but yeah, actually it probably would have changed things up had they had a log scale for the, the income. But anyway, um, this is how the outcome versus each explanatory variable looks. And we are now going to look at um, how we can actually, let me see, how did I? Okay, so here, um, um, because of the fact that we're dealing with two categorical, uh, two uh, con um, continuous variables, they, you, you can see your, you know, your garden variety, uh, Y is equal to, uh, you know, A plus, B plus MX or whatever that is, but it's, it's basically your parameter, which is your intercept. And then you have your various uh, um, explanatory variables with their uh, associated parameters. So uh, this is just your regular um, straight uh, uh, LM, right? Like there's, there's no interaction here, at least I don't think so. Is that right, you guys? Because I mean, this looks like a straight LM equation to me. Uh, I think there is an interaction because there's different slopes for each term. Uh, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Oh, I'm going with uh, the V here on this one. It doesn't look like there's an interaction. Yeah, because... Because um, you're starting at the negative 385, your increase for every point of credit limit set and your increase for every dollar um, set and there's not like another there, there should be an additional um, yeah variable there yeah so yeah that that that's kind of what i thought like it was um it just looked like it was your you know your standard um y equal to mx plus b equation um but then it had like a more than one explanatory variable but um so um, if you, so here, um, so they want us to test this out for another um, a set of explanatory variables, credit rating and age, it's part of their learning check. And so I did, I did just that. And here again, you can tell that the credit rating and your debt are like pretty, um, okay, pretty tightly correlated. And then the, your, your, actually your age and your credit rating, they don't have much of, uh, you know, there's not much of collinearity there because it's, it's pretty low. Uh, it's about 0.1. So credit trading and debt, again, are tied pretty tightly together. So it's, it's just the same exercise, but it's, it's just their own version of, uh, uh, like, they just wanted you to try this out yourself. So uh, like, uh, like we saw earlier with this, the credit trading and debt was 0.86 and the age and, and the credit rating and age was 0.103. Point one oh three, and you can tell that here it's there's like really very little correlation between age and credit card debt, um, and it's it's just the same thing. This um, this is basically what whatever we saw earlier for the two numeric uh, explanatory variables. It's just the exercise that we had, um, and so now he gets into why you would choose one over the other. So. Uh, Matt, to your point, I guess here he doesn't really get into um, using um, interaction for numerical, right? So, like you said, that that's part of the additional resources. Um, so yeah, here we are. To... Sorry, it's it's in the related topics. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So that's why I thought that I had not actually seen that. But um, so now he wants to, he talks about why you would choose one over the other, like why you would look for interaction uh, or why you would choose parallel slopes. And he actually brings up uh, two examples. One is what we already saw 
and this is the score versus um, teaching score versus uh, age uh, relative to your gender. And this is yet another data set where they are looking at your SAT scores um, relative to the size of the school and how economically disadvantaged your, your, uh, your background is. Um, I don't know if it's your background or if it's the background of the school district. I'm not sure about that. But suffice to say that you can tell that even though the intercepts appear to be different, like the slopes largely look the same between the interaction and parallel slopes. Whereas here you can tell that, there, I mean, between the, the, the previous uh, data set, you could tell that there was a significant difference with that X kind of crossing over. With this, it, um, it seems like, you know, they, they, they seem to be similar regardless of this. So begs the question, do you want to go through the complexity of interaction if the slopes appear to be almost parallel and the intercepts also seem to be pretty close, maybe with a little bit of a difference. So do you actually need to put yourself through an interaction model and the complexity there, or could you just make do with the, the parallel slope model? So it, um, this is again, just looking at how, you know, how, how much more complicated the table. The table on top is the one for the interaction and the table at the bottom is the one for just the parallel slopes. And you can tell like, there's a huge uh, difference, like one has six and one has four. So, so I think he's trying to make the case for like, you know, be canny in when you decide to do interaction or when you want to do parallel slopes, because sometimes it's, it's really not worth the extra, uh, you know, extra complexity that it uh, entails. So this is something a little bit interesting. Uh, and actually, I did not realize this. Apparently, if you transform your your um, explanatory variables, your correlation coefficient does not change. And to me, this kind of threw me in for a loop because what you see on top is before transformation, what you see at the bottom is after. And you can tell that between the debt and income, like they are exactly the same. Uh, well, I, I guess in the second one, they only selected debt and income. I'm not sure why they didn't actually select the credit limit, like if it would have, um, I mean, it's already pretty high to start with, maybe that's why. But the one that could have used some improvement, it didn't change anything. And I always was under the impression that transforming actually transforms your data to make your, your regression line like fit better. So this was surprising to me. Like, is anyone surprised by the fact that correlation coefficient does not change? Like, even if you transform your explanatory variables, I was surprised. Well, I, I not. I mean, I, I get what you're saying there, uh, right? Because we do talk about re-expression in terms of getting better fits all the time. Yeah. I think the correlation, though, it's like, it's basically like covariance, but standardized. So scales removed, right? I think they removed the, I think um, what's happening there is they're removing the average, they're removing the standard deviation, they're getting it on a very common scale where it's unitless, and then they're taking the covariance. And that's sort of what intuitively correlations telling us is how they co-vary without considering units. So if you scale something, but it still has the same um, relationship variation wise, if one goes up and the other goes up and it's going up, because you're not changing the standard deviation, you're just expanding it for one of the variables, right? You're just expanding the, the range that value now extends across, but the relationship's gonna be the same. One standard deviation changed, two standard deviation changes, in one variable that's highly correlated with another, regardless of the scales, gonna be gonna come out with the same correlation. I see. Okay. Yeah. So this is actually really interesting. So they introduced this. I mean, I'm sure you've heard of the Simpsons paradox, where when you have an aggregate, when you aggregate data across like all of your groups, something looks like it's trending upwards, and then actually when, and I think you might, well, if if you. Um, if you've been following Twitter, you probably realize that the Palmer Penguins, did you guys see the new data set that's come in place of uh, the Iris data set? Like there's like a really fantastic case of Simpsons Firebox right there. So, and someone actually, I don't know if, uh, um, if they knew it when they created that, but when you, uh, it's, it's different across all the three um, subspecies of penguins or species of penguins, the Gen 2, Chinstrap and whatever. But like when you aggregate them together, like there's um, there's like an upward trend between the, like it's something to do with their 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 builds or like the width and the diameter or whatever. So that's like a classic Simpsons paradox right there. So what it is is that when you aggregate something in in a group, it it could appear to be trending up, but then when you actually break it up 
and you tease out your um, what, you know, the one that could be confounding it, like you can find that, that that is like really not representative of what is going on. So here, for example, you can see that in your credit card um, debt versus income, like it's obviously the slope looks like it's pointing up, right? So this is, um, this is a positive slope between your credit card debt and income. However, if you look at the income estimate here, it's actually a negative value. So like the relationship between income and debt here is it's it's negative so the, the the that particular slope was was a negative number so what's going on but uh, while while this was only looking at debt and income this is looking at debt income and it has credit limit thrown in there so what what is credit limit exactly doing to this relationship that's causing that slope to actually trend negatively and it's kind of cool what they did is that they actually broke up um the um the they, they segregated them into the credit limit brackets based on like whatever the cutoffs were like to go from low to medium etc and what they found is that with the low and the medium and the me the medium low and the medium high it actually trends downwards like you would expect based on the on on your on the regression table but it's actually a, a positive um relationship with the, with the high credit limit. I mean, it's not as positive as what you're seeing on the left, um, but it, it's still positive. So that's uh, another interesting thing that when you actually have multiple interactions, you could actually be masking, uh, you know, what's going on at the subunit level. So I'm, this kind of made me wonder, like maybe for all my analyses going forward, I should never take the leap and look for like the combinations. Like I should actually do my due diligence do my individual interactions and then and then start like maybe creating like <clears throat> you know two three four etc depending on how many of them i want to see and then try and see what they look like you know in as an aggregate so like i, I felt like that, that this was like a valuable lesson to have learned like you know individual versus aggregate it's it's not gonna you know be the, the complete picture so that's all i had i am um, not sure if i confuse people more by my confusion but in any case i thoroughly enjoyed like delving into this it was just a lot more complicated than i thought <laughs> yeah that was great thank you for doing that um I, yeah I, th I thought that was really interesting it was a good review for sure um yeah i mean i and you know i noticed that they actually had a problem set which i think uh, they had created for their students so it might be kind of worth it to you know, try it out and possibly discuss it in the group because th this kind of thing can, you can forget it really fast and like the best way to do it is to actually probably, you know, uh, work through some examples. So I can, I can drop that link there in like just a bit once I get off the call. Okay. Good job, you took a tough, tough chapter. <laughs> um, hey Matt, do I stop recording or do I pause recording? Like what, what's the deal here? Uh, I guess you can stop since we're, um okay. since, well actually let's let's just keep it going until like we all okay. leave just in case there's interesting okay. conversation yeah i don't know if yeah. any, everyone wanted to be recorded so that's why oh i see um well we could put it to the group then uh yeah. what do you what do you does anybody is there a preference i'm fine either way makes I'm sense so oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay either way. How do you feel, uh, Pavitra? Hmm. So I, um, Jim posted something in, in chat and I actually went over his link. Like he had a link to this, uh, I think Dave, Daniel Kaplan and it's actually really pretty well, uh, well done. Like their, their, their chapter on interaction terms is, it definitely gets, uh, it's, it's a lot clearer than what, um, what Chester and, uh, Albert have done. So, um, if you haven't looked at it, I would really encourage you to look at it. I think it's fairly like early in the book, so it might, um, I mean, I didn't have a chance to look at all of it, obviously, because I started today, but it's pretty well explained there, I thought. So, yeah, so I, I mean, I think this, um, this opens up a bunch of really interesting things because I'm always dealing with um, continuous explanatory variables. And I always never did think about ever like, you know, looking at them in, 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 in their individual, like whatever states. So I've always like pulled them together. 
But now when I think about it, doesn't R actually the core function, doesn't it actually give you a, like a matrix of each one, like separately, the separate interaction? So I'm, maybe it's not such a bad thing after all. Like you actually can see like each one like in itself, right? Before it gives you the, the all the interaction things happening. Like I do, re I do remember it gives you like a matrix of interaction. So I'm, I'm thinking it's like a one-on-one -on -one at that point. Yeah, I've, I've seen that with, so it's funny, you brought up the mm -hmm. penguins and Simpsons paradox. Like I almost I made, the mis made the mistake, nice. I almost made the mistake of um, not paying attention to basically the different penguin uh, species, but I used um, Gigi Ali, the um, oh, package okay. that does the visualizations of like all the variables in the matrix. Yeah. And yeah. Um, when I added the color by species, it made it really clear that there was the Simpsons paradox going on there. Oh, you you um, you got it when you did that, and you like that's smart that you figured that out. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can't take credit for it. Like, I kind of like uh, stumbled upon it. Like, I I was looking for a way of visualizing a lot of variables at once, and when yeah. I happened upon Gigi Ali and added that color um, aesthetic, I was like, oh wow, there's there's like this Simpsons paradox thing going on here. So um, you could actually see a stark difference between um, like when you just have like color and whatever, and then you actually added the additional. Absolutely, yeah, and it actually it'll show you. I can actually show you if I want, if you want. Yeah, I can you do that? I'd love to see that. Yeah, let me. So um, did you like? What did you do? Did you just like add them one by one? Like, did you did you just do it like sequentially or? No. What's awesome about Gigi Ali is that it like it's kind of just does everything at once um but let's see so i let me i think it's in, i think i stopped sharing so you should be able to okay yeah let me see if i can pull up the project okay so here's what it looked like can you see my screen yeah Okay, so no, that's not it. Where is it? Yeah, so here's what the output looks like. And um actually let me make this bigger. Yeah, it's it's very helpful. So oh it's still re-rendering. Hold on. Wow. So you can see that like for flipper length and bill length, it looks like, or wait, where is it? It's actually, it's with bill depth and flipper length. So it looks like there's a negative correlation on the whole between bill depth and flipper length. Um, that you can see that in the, in the, in the black text here. But um, when you break it out by species, there's actually a positive correlation. So like you basically have Simpson's paradox just kind of like staring at you in the face. And you also see it, you also see it in the visualization. Um, so if you do uh, build depth, let's see, what column is that under? Build depth. It's a it's and, a what's that? Uh, it's a third one, the third column. Uh, the third column, yeah. Um, third column in the same row, you can see that there are these two different distributions. So, um, so yeah, I, I thought this was pretty neat. It's, it's useful. So this, this doesn't actually give you the whole group distribution. It's, it, it is breaking it up. Like you can't actually, other than the core, the core, the correlation coefficient, you can't actually see the, the graphs are all broken up by group, right? Like you can't see in total. Yeah, the, the graphs are all broken up by group. That's true. It doesn't. So you, you gathered that looking at the, co the correlation coefficient, is that correct? Well, uh, yeah, looking at the correlation co coefficient was how I not noticed the Simpsons paradox. But then there's also like, you kind of see it in the scatter plots too. So actually here it is. So in the build, okay, so in this second column here, in the third row, 
you you see the um, it's just a scatter plot of bill length colored by species. Yeah. And so you can see that, like you can see for sure that they're positively correlated as long as you are looking at it by species. Correct. Um, but yeah. But you but there's no graph which shows you something which is not like when it, which is not colored. Like can you actually have one where you haven't broken it up by groups and, and just look you at can. the whole group? Yeah, you can. yeah, you can so, so the yeah. code for that, you just drop the um, the color aesthetic. Okay. And then rerun it and it'll um, oh I have to run some of these other chunks. But Basically, yeah, if you drop that color aesthetic, you can see everything overall. Uh, so let me just, let me run this. No, no, that's okay, Matt, don't worry. Okay, okay. I mean, I didn't want to bother you. So I, I think thing that was um, interesting to piggyback on was we were talking about collinearity, and that's actually a good point. Um, in this case, though, you're, when you're, one's um, explaining another variable, like we were using, yeah. Um, whichever two were highly correlated, because we were predicting um, one with the other, it's actually perfect. Like you want to have highly correlated variables in your model. What you wouldn't want to do is use them both as predictors. That's true. Yeah. I think that's a, uh, a good point. See, I don't see the negative trend at all, actually, Matt. I I don't know how to determine that. Other than the, the coefficient, like the graph itself doesn't. Oh, I see. In, in, in the, bill, the bill length versus flipper length? Yeah. Yeah, so you'll see it. Uh, let's see. It's, I guess you would see it in the, or sorry, bill depth versus flipper length. So, hmm. Yeah, I think, I, I kind of know where you're going. It's probably not like terribly easy to, um, but yeah, like de definitely drop it in chat when, when you know, when it occurs to you, because it's, it's not very <laughs> easy to like think on the fly like this. So no, that's totally okay. Yeah, I don't know. That's interesting. But yeah, it's, um, your graphs are beautiful though. I love it. It's, it's gorgeous. Uh, I wish yeah. I could take credit. You eyeball it, you can see how the cloud starts out higher and then starts progressively getting lower. Like, the, like you, there's not a minimum value anywhere in range of where you start out um, until you get down, like, halfway through that that plot of bill length and, and build up. So, there, I mean, yeah, it's like, it's wide, but you can see that it slopes down. Like, you start progressively getting lower and lower. Um, True. Um, that is true, yeah. That's true. Hmm. And so did, um, and I guess they're looking at a bunch of different variables at the same time, right? So there, there's got to be interaction there. Yeah, I think, I think the interaction becomes clear when you add the color aesthetic. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's kind of what introduces it. So the based on species, right? Like the color aesthetic is mapped to species then? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was doing before. Nice, that's very cool. Um, I'd love, I mean, if you can also drop a link to your GitHub or wherever you have this code, I'd love to see it. I Because I haven't personally worked with G-Galley or G G Alley or whatever. Oh, you it's G Galley. I've been mispronouncing it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no worries. You're uh, right. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Go ahead and also give us a, a point us to your your Git, and I I love the Git for that. It's so cool. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I will. I'll do that. Nice. Uh, okay. Cool. Uh, so, so the interesting thing is now I can't see the option to actually, okay, there you go. Shall I, um, are you, do you guys, are you guys okay with my stopping the recording? Yep. Or? Yeah, I think we're good.